So it's a pleasure to have you, Iran, too. And I hand over to you as chair. Um, so thank you very much, uh, Susanne and uh, BNN, uh, for giving me the opportunity and the pleasure uh, to chair this uh, session. Uh, and I hope that we keep you awake after the nice lunch also offered by BNN. Uh, so the session is about um, tools and approaches uh, developed to support the SSBD process or specific steps within it. Uh, safe and sustainable by design requires multidisciplinary and multidisciplinary uh, thinking, assessment, optimization, and decision making. And here in this session, we will learn about the tools developed in these uh, projects that are finalizing um, this month. Um, and we will start with uh, the Sabina project and the guidance platform and safe by design for nano e infrastructure uh, to support the design process towards safer nano forms nano enabled products and processes okay long um, title for a presentation that it will be um, um, presented with, uh, by ralph van houten from thinkworks uh, from the netherlands Hey, good afternoon, everyone. I hope uh, you enjoyed your lunch. Uh, let me briefly introduce myself. My name is Ralph van Hout from ThinkWorks. Together with my colleague Leon Tras, we are responsible for the development of the Sabina Guidance Platform and also uh, the uh, SBD for Nano e infrastructure. And um, as you can see, the aims of these goals, as already mentioned by, uh, by the, the, the leader, is that the SBD support for development of safer NEP and, and processes. So it, it targets a lot of, and we have to try to cover all of it in, in, in one or two platforms, you know. Many of the presentations this morning you already saw, uh, and they already introduced parts and modules of those platforms. So um, here you can see uh, the, the introduction of the both platforms. I don't know which is the pointer, I think this one. Yeah, so at the left you can see the Sabina Guidance Platform, the landing page of, the, of that one, and then on the right is the SBD for Nano E Infrastructure. And as you can see already in the in the purple box in the middle, they are based upon work already done within Guide Nano and uh, Gracious, and we build upon them. So we reuse and improve existing parts of them. Uh, they share the same IT platform and also the same philosophy behind it. Both are online tools and they allow multiple users to access them and work together in the case. Um, so there, uh, there's a lot of shared functionalities, and that also. Bring, is, is logic that then also we should present them in, in one presentation because we basically can merge them and then we also intend to do that. But of course they are separate projects so they also have their own developments. Uh, and, and at the left you can see that uh, uh, Sabina developed uh, specific resources already introduced this morning as uh, simplified LCA, usability cards, guidelines and also uh, SPD for Nano did. Uh, with the article search engines, diamond resources presented by Wouter this morning, uh, the NQ interaction. So you can already imagine that both projects contribute in their own, but they also have a lot in common. And now in the next slide, we will see how that is organized. So how can these two tools facilitate uh, the, the safe by design uh, process and what we aim to do with it? So think of you have your existing nanoform, your baseline scenario, and you want to, um, to, to make it safe or um, better in, uh, perform or uh, less exposure, etc. then first of all, the first step would be to do an orientation. So you go to what is already in the literature, what, what are the lessons learned, etc. But you can also use the platforms to start a case. And this is what I'm going to focus upon a bit today. So the starting point when you start a case is the case configuration. So you need to identify what's, what, what's the case about. So what are the all the, uh, the what, what are the actors? Uh, what sector am I dealing with? What are the products and materials uh, involved in, in my in my, uh, in my scenario? With, which use scenarios are there? Which contributing scenarios within them? Um, what kind of compartments are we dealing with? That can be indoor air compartments, but also environmental compartments like marine water, fresh water, soil. And of course, which are the receptors we're dealing with? So this is all configuration. It doesn't require data. It just adds in, uh, asks information from the user to provide on the, on the case itself. Of course, you can already start adding known information. 
but uh, this is not something which you have to do all at once. Right? It's a gradual process, which once you proceed within your case, you can add multiple uh, uh, new products, intermediate products, etc. The next step, after you have done your case configuration, you need to identify what are the key aspects. So what do I need to assess in my case? What are the hotspots? Um, and also, we want to identify what are our SBD goals, because it's not one, there are multiple SBD goals in a single life cycle. Okay, so let's have a look at this identification. So for, if you're interested in costs, we need to know the cost components. If you're interested in functional performance, we need to know what the functional requirements are of our products, or of our nanoform, but also on our nano-enabled product. If you're dealing with activities, what are the release mechanisms we are, we are dealing with? What are the forms uh, released? And from that, we can then also identify what are the exposure and the potential following up hazard scenarios. And all of these here make together the SBD goals. You can extract the SBD goals from that. And very early in your design, you can from these, uh, just by the identification of the SBD goals, go already very early to the provided modules from SPD for Nano and, uh, and Sabina uh, to, to get an early indication what potential strategies might be there. Of course, often you will first then uh, make a decision on gathering additional information before uh, implementing anything, you know? So after, you dis after the user made, made the decision, then you, you go back and you are going to do the qualification or quantification. So basically you are trying uh, to, 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 to provide values uh, for the different identified elements, like for instance, the cost, the prices, what are, uh, and, and do the cost assessment. Uh, on functionalities, often the manufacturer, which can do some preliminary testing or theoretical use uh, theoretical models. Uh, so you start often with the theoretical ones, and uh, perhaps at later stages in your design, uh, you might uh, opt for uh, measure, measure, measure it. Um, when we go to the release mechanisms and forms, there is from Sabina, for instance, sector-specific libraries we have been filling in. And from SBD for Nano, we have the hotspot scan, which was already mentioned this morning. Um, for the exposure and hazard scenarios, we have from Sabina, originated from the guide nano tool, the kinetic phase simulation model, which is a multi-zone, uh, multi-box uh, uh, model, which can predict uh, the, the, the kinetics and the phase of uh, particles. And also, as already introduced this morning, the NEQ tool. Uh, more from the hazard perspective, if you are very early in your screening, and Neil already introduced this this morning a bit, then you have the uh, Sabina screening module, which can already very early in your in your uh, design indicate if there are certain concerns you already know immediately based on CLP labeling or other in, uh, um, rules which are um, common used here. But you can also perhaps a bit later in the, in the design uh, use some of the QSAR models um, provided by SPD for Nano. Of course, Another option is here to use existing data, grouping approaches, read across, that kind of uh, approaches, which are in the theoretical. Or you can use the hazard testing strategy developed within Sabina or any other testing strategy, of course. But this, this one is then also providing uh, specific tests, as described this morning uh, by, by Anna, uh, which are low cost, low tier, screening uh, uh, test methods. From these assessments, you get information. And that information then can be used, again, to find out what are potential strategies um, uh, to, uh, yeah, to achieve our safe by design goals. So once you have introduced such a strategy, you can then decide to implement it, huh? make sample of it with a surface modification. A change a process parameter or implement a, a certain control. And then that information you can feed back in your case configuration. And that then allows you to compare scenarios here. And then that could mean, okay, if you compare it, it's okay, it's uh, good enough, and we go to the higher tier of our innovation uh, chain in, before the regulatory obligations start. Uh, and once you pass this, you can launch your product. 
But you can also decide, oh, it's not good enough. Let's go back and see what all the alternative strategies are there um, and, and go basically back. So it's an iterative process. And during this process, you will see that you will add alternative materials, alternative uh, situations, alternative contributing scenarios, which you then can uh, compare here and make decisions upon. It's a decision support. Yeah? Okay. Let's now have a look how this uh, looks in the tools. So for the um, for the uh, identification, so the burst, the, the idea to to look what's already uh, done. There are resources uh, both from Sabina. Uh, you can see here this droplets, and you click on this, and you get to the uh, resources made available here. So there are usability cards, uh, the data platforms which you can access. Um, and the, the, the LCA tools uh, mentioned this morning, the Diamonds platform, the Athena document search, the regulatory observatory and, and resource libraries. And just, these are just some examples. I could not put them all on the screen. There are many of them. Um, but that's the, the, the starting point. The next point would be start a case. And now we're getting to the part of the dashboard. So this is once you enter either Sabina or SBD Fernando and you open the case here at the bottom, you can see here how this is organized. This is a tile view. This is an existing case we entered. So here you can see uh, the product value chain, uh, the, the early substances, and then at the, at the bottom you have the downstream products. So you can have different nanoforms, substances, mixtures, articles, etc. cetera. Um, the same for the life cycle here. You can organize the life cycle according to the to the phases, the manufacturing stage, formulation repacking, use at industrial sites, the service life. And each of these use scenarios then contain the contributing scenarios. There can be many, eh, depending on, on uh, how, what you are, are dealing with. Also, you need to introduce here the life cycle compartments. So that may, may be indoor rooms, but it can all, also be the outdoor environment nearby or uh, the soil. And then you can also here see the, the receptors. So you can introduce different worker populations or consumer populations or even ecosystems which are living in the soil. And as you can remember, I also talked about the identification of key aspects. And here at the bottom, you can see indicators. And this uh, triangle, this, this orange triangle indicates that at some point in our life cycle, this nanoform is released. Uh, this red dot indicates that uh, somewhere in our life cycle, this nanoform is an exposure relevant material. Um, you can also see here, this D, this is indication for design. This is a design goal. So op most obviously within this, within this use scenario, there is a design goal. The same for the for the triangles here. You can see there are activities where materials are released, or um, acti activities where a certain exposure might happen. Here in the compartments, there are compartments with exposure potentially uh, in there, and you can see here that the populations at the bottom with these X and e A H, which is exposure and hazard indicates that we have to, to deal with the exposure here and with hazard scenarios accordingly. So this is a helicopter view and you can immediately see what's in your case. And then at the left and at the right, we can see modules. So there are different modules in there, the SBD options to compare existing data, the speeding module, cost comparison, the phase simulation, exposure, hazard, etc. cetera. Um, we can also click on these tiles and then we can go to the point to provide information. Let's do that. So if you are dealing with substances, uh, nanoforms in this case, you have to provide all kinds of information. So you can provide information on composition and chemistry, how the particle is organized. Is it a shell with no, uh, yet another shell around it? Is it surface modified? And, and basically uh, describe the, the surface interaction with the external media. We can also provide information on shape, size, specific surface area, porosity, and of course, identification information like labeling and the technical functions. If you already have measured data on your original nanoform, you can also add assays and provide the raw data here, which then can be used in comparison. 
And also, for instance, you can add information on the crystallinity. So this is just a, a quick snapshot of what, what you can do in the material part. So when we go to the next slide, you can see a similar approach here. But then for the use scenario, so you have to introduce different contributing scenarios. What type of contributing scenario are we dealing with? Are we mixing, spraying, um, sanding, abrasing? That kind of activity types indications. We can describe the material flow, so what goes in an activity step, what goes out, the amounts, the relative amounts, are there releases, what prices are involved. We can indicate information about the duration of the activity, the uptime, downtime, is it cyclic or not, the energy consumption, and also we can indicate the exposure pathways and the routes of exposure, what are the relevant materials, and are there already PPE used, for instance. So there's a lot of information you can provide already, but you're not obliged to do it all at once. If you got more information, you just add it. Similar for the compartments, so we can see here uh, the dimensions, the zones within the compartment, how they are connected to each other, how they are oriented, uh, orientated to each other, are there openings, what uh, engineered controls are already pre present, what energy consumption are we dealing with, what are the zones in it, and the media, the composition, what are the specific properties. Then the tool can already, based on that, predict what relevant fate processes might be act become active and what might be the expected speciation from those in the zones you are dealing with. Yeah? So now we have all talked about the case configuration. And the next step is, of course, to apply modules or assessment parts. And there are quite a lot coming from Sabina and SBD for Nano. Uh, here you can see the screening phase, the simulation of the fate I mentioned, exposure models and access points to the NEQ model, for instance, and other exposure models which might be out there. The hazard testing strategy, as mentioned this morning, uh, but also we can make use of data, existing data. And it was already mentioned this morning, the Ombit instances and the, uh, all the data in Inanomapper, actually we, we are able to upload that, map it, and use it. Uh, so this is uh, just one uh, Ombit instance, but there are many in there. Um, and you can see down here how we use it. So you can do some similarity assessment or compare a certain endpoints coming from the data from different projects. Um, we have the template libraries for sector-specific information on release, for instance. Uh, there's cost assessment in it, comparison scenarios of costs, uh, hazards, um, and we also have two SBD methods in place. This one here is the SBD method coming from Sabina, and this one here is the one developed with an SBD uh, for Nano. And I, I'm now going to go into a bit more detail on this because this is really about design, yeah? So if you could, rem can we remember, I showed the, the life cycle, the use scenarios here, and then here, the indications of this is capital D. You can also see here an icon that there's a technical function involved. And these indicate that there are design goals, and we can see them here at the top, you see, different design goals. We have de developed an algorithm, which is hypothesis driven. So it's basically saying, what are the causal relationships between one feature and another? If one goes up, do we expect the other one also to go up or the opposite way? Uh, it's multidimensional. Huh? We want to consider product performance, exposure, hazard, et cetera. Um, it's also space, uh, case specific. So each time you change something in your configuration or add a value, you can see here that these inference diagrams, they are generated from that. So each time you change a new set of inference diagrams is generated based on these hypotheses. And each of these contribute to a certain goal. And we can use these inference diagrams to extract strategies for each of these individual goals. And you can see them listed here. So for this goal, these are the options we have. For this goal, these are the options we have. And then what the tool can do is combine all these strategies, these local strategies, into an overarching strategy for all our, the entire life cycle and all the goals within it. And at the top here, you have the most promising ones. So perhaps it's worthwhile to start with those to investigate. Uh, and at the bottom, you see those, but you can better avoid, perhaps not do that. 
because most likely it will have an adverse effect. One thing which is very important to keep track of is the fact that you can have contradiction strategies. So something which is good for your hazard is bad for performance or the other way around. It can be also across the life cycle. So something which is good for preventing work exposure could be worse for the environment. And the tool is able to indicate where these uh, conflicts might occur. So that's just to give you an idea how a tool can support end users in providing options what potentially can be done. Um, the, each of these strategies is a textual suggestion provided with the rationale behind it. So why does the tool make this suggestion? Yeah, you can, as a user, you can just say, okay, and this is not relevant for me, but this is more relevant and I tried that first. And it is progressive. So if you provide additional information like values or measured data, some of these alternatives might not be relevant anymore. And it can also be that the design space you have is limited. So it doesn't make sense to go from a big room to an even bigger room, but it, it, it uh, can make sense to go from a small room to a bigger room. Yeah, that kind of design options uh, are incorporated. So what is the, uh, the impact of this? I think the first thing is that users become aware of what they have to consider along the life cycle. So what's, what are all the key aspects to assess? It will also, in, in my uh, personal opinion, really increase the innovation efficiency. So avoid perhaps a few steps which you would normally take. Right? Just try to reduce the number of iterations. And with that, development time and costs. Perhaps if we are improving our hypothesis even more, it will be available, uh, it will be um, have the opportunity to come up with design options you would not have considered yet uh, for an end user. And our future plans are to merge the platforms into a single tool. Um, we also have a project, the Safari project, which is a Horizon one, which we will use to further develop the, in this incorporation. And we also want to establish a community. And finally, I want, I really would like to thank all the partners, both from Sabina and SBD for Nano, but also the ones from Guy Nano and Gracious, who all contributed in some way to all the knowledge which has been incorporated in this, uh, in this, in these two platforms. Thank you very much, Raf. Very interesting presentation. I'm sure that there are a lot of questions in the room. We only have four minutes, so okay. Um, yeah. Hey, Ralph. This looks super impressive. Uh, a very holistic approach. I very much like those influence diagrams. Also, um, I just wonder in which stage of which size of an innovation project we would implement this. To me, this looks like something that is already quite demanding, but especially the strength of comparing many alternatives means that you want to apply this in the lab phase when you have many different versions. But that means you need a very big investment decision to be made. So a multi-million euro project. Um, it would create a big incentive in the way that Neil presented if the decisions that follow out are documented. So that's my question. How do you document the decisions made, the reasoning made? Because then it might be very useful. Um, if I, I already indicated that the, the, the suggestions, the strategies the tool comes up with, yeah, that these are um, up, uh, accompanied with the rationale behind it. So the tool does explain why it does make that reasoning. Uh, and that that we we can trace that back, so you can it, it's also also reproducible. Uh, so if you would have the same case, it would provide the same suggestions. If you alter a, 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 a value, you will see the difference. You are not obliged to start with a big case. You can just start with a single nanoform with a single compartment, uh, and do and use a tool for that. But if you want to know also the impacts down your life cycle, you go bigger. As you also saw in the slide, it's a bit of a tiered approach. So 
very early in your design, you use theoretical models, perhaps norms, huh? and that kind of uh, new developments, which are computational, are not that costly, hopefully. And then you can gradually move towards the, the f further down the road, huh? towards the regular, when you want, you, you are confident that this is the, the way to go. Then you would do the next step of investments and do the st start the, the, te the, the more uh, costly testing and feed that information back, and then it will reduce the number of options which you might have. Because you, you will have multiple strategies along your life cycle, it's not one. You need to do something at worker, you need to do something at the consumer part, etc. I hope I understand the question well, but we can always discuss it afterwards so, uh, to understand better what, uh, what, you, what you were asking. Okay, we only have time for an, one additional question, so I don't know which. Okay. Yes, I was interested in uh, how you uh, got your algorithm together. Did you? Is it was this conceptual, or did you have a training and validation data set to generate and test also that the algorithm works? Um, what well, this is a very early stage development. Huh? So, in the sense that what the strategies are offering, they don't have to be accurate in the sense that uh, they need to be always right. So uh, the hypotheses are coming from what was developed within the project in different work practices, can all be also be extracted from data, but it can also come from literature. So it's common sense kind of hypothesis. But if you have these individual building blocks and you chain them, a bit comparable with the advanced outcome pathways, huh? there's also that kind of approach, then you can, at runtime, generate these inference diagrams. And we hope, we, and that's really what we aim at, is that at least these kinds of approaches will eliminate some of the trial and error exercises at this stage. Yeah, so the, the, the first one might not be the best one, but hopefully the second one is. So that's a bit the idea behind it. Yeah, it's support, it's not decision making. Thank you very much, Raf. I think that you are going to be very busy in the coffee grave break, but uh, now I, we have to. Um, welcome the next uh, speaker, Massimo Peruca from uh, Project Hub um, 360, uh, based in Torino, Italy, and he's going to give a presentation on an integrated qualitative, quantitative approach in safe and sustainable by design support systems from Asina to Integrano expert system. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Renzo. Uh, thank you for your attention after this nice lunch and exchange of information. So uh, this is the uh, presentation outline. We would like to present a quantitative based approach uh, to safe and sustainable by design, which is case specific, oriented to case specific studies. Uh, we will provide some highlight on Azina results because the Azina project has just ended at the end of the month, last month, February, and Integrano, um, SSBD workflow, uh, which is just started. So uh, we will also dwell a bit in, into the principle of a decision support system for safe and sustainable by design. And uh, well, we'll provide some example of the as an expert system elaboration to provide a, a specific uh, case study and highlight on how it works. And then limitation advantages and uh, of course uh, discussion maybe during question time and uh, maybe further on. So this is the framework in which uh, uh, we operate. Uh, we, we consider uh, different life cycle stages. We can focus on one life cycle stage and the decision support system can be used and applied at a multi-level. So at each life cycle stage and for different uh, dimensions like uh, environmental, uh, safety, functional and economic dimensions. So one of the features is that we can keep all together simultaneously at the, at the same time without ranking them in advance. Ranking and, and weighting can be done after the analysis. Uh, this is basically the, the workflow. So we define the scope, uh, we uh, analyze the performance in terms of sustainability, costing, social sustainability in Integrano projects as well performance because we can we are addressing to uh, industrial products so we we need performance to some extent functional technical and safety dimension as well then the workflow goes through data management data curation harmonization 
production of fair data as an input to the decision support system. And then there is the analysis part, which provides as an output indications on safe and sustainable by design cases. The DSS does not decide for the humans. It's a human-centric approach. So it's a support to decision. Um, so uh, what are the requirements to, to run the DSS and to have hopefully some good uh, indication? First, uh, uh, well, since it is quantitative and case specific, we have to create data and obtain data either by specific experiment already carried out within specific uh, in, in synthesis and incorporation plans or testing for the use phase simulation. And then we have to uh, assure harmonization of data, which is very important, quality, reliability, and fairness of data. This is a starting point. And as uh, we are referring to already existing standards, for instance, the LCA standard 14,044, we have four phases in the life cycle assessment. We apply the same standard as a conceptual workflow. And uh, the, the first stage is scoping and uh, uh, defining of goals. And this includes the functional unit we have to measure. This was a recall this morning in LCA presentations. So we will have to weight all uh, imp, uh, KPIs based on performance, okay? System boundary, uh, hypothesis, cutoffs, everything that uh, has been addressed to uh, the uh, life cycle assessment methodology is recalled here. And important to say, we have to define the key decision factors. So the variables that will be changed in the design of experiment matrix that will provide the key performance indicators values for a limited number of testing cases. So this is very important because this is based on artificial intelligence, but we are not pointing to big data because if you are developing something, we don't have time, you would have enough money, we don't have enough resources to carry out millions of tests. That's the, 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 the strategy. And then after that, we will define in KPIs that we represent the all dimensions, safety, environment, costs, uh, social functionality, et cetera and definition of experimental campaign. So we will end up with a defined design of experiment matrix, which will involve all the key decision factors and the key relative performance indicators. This implies uh, having a work level in, in terms of modeling, so computation, if you want to address the life cycle assessment of the process or, or, or the life cycle, and experimental data that will uh, characterize the physical chemical properties of nanoforms we are synthesizing or incorporating into matrices. And then uh, there will be also the toxicological assessment to define endpoints of our toxicity standpoint. All this information will be fed into the decision support system. We will see in a bit how. And what does the decision support system do? Well, Basically, it will provide response functions for all the KPIs within all dimensions and will correlate the decision factors with the KPIs, the key performance indicators. So we will map the two spaces. These are multidimensional spaces. Here, just three dimensions are represented. This is the Zena workflow, just to Recall the main concept that I was mentioning you before. So definition of life cycle of, of sorry of, of a life cycle stage, uh, for instance, the incorporation process of nanoforms, definition of the KPIs and the KDF, uh, definition of the design of experiment matrix, production of data in terms of life cycle assessment, costing, experimental characterization of nanoforms uh, obtained by the synthesis of each of those representative points in the decision uh, matrix, in the, the, the DOA matrix, sorry, and then harmonization of data and fitting into the decision support system, which will provide answers. And then we'll see which kind of answers. So this is the workflow within the decision support system. Uh, it will map the space, design space into performance space. 
think about the previous boxes diagram, it will sort the multi-optimal design cases. This is very important. So it will sort among all possible points in the design of experiment space, the ones that will maximize simultaneously all the KPIs. Of course, as we learned before, there are conflicts in, in KPIs. You might have high costs because you are getting high functionality or will have high environmental impact because you want to get the maximum functionality. So the decision support system will, system will provide you the solutions that will negotiate at best the conditions that are suggested for the SSBD uh, cases. And uh, the human decision maker then is, is provided uh, with the answers, with these multi-optimal points in the performance space. But then, okay, I, can, I want to get this point, which is the best one for me in terms of multiple performance. What are the key decision factors? So what are the synthesis parameters that will lead me to that result? And that it was uh, what is uh, the DSS doing. So pointing back the points that are providing you those consequences, which are the best ones possible. Okay, uh, the combinations and in the, in the end, the human dec decision maker knows everything. So he has awareness and, and can take uh, informed decisions. So the decisions are taken by humans. Let's see some specific cases. Well, one which is representative. I want to select one of the many cases uh, addressed within Azina. This is the value chain one, the synthesis of uh, antibacterial nanoparticles. And uh, among all, the, all those are this life cycle stage one synthesis of uh, silver uh, egg hydroxyl <coughs> cellulose. Okay, uh, what, uh, what is the Azina and Integrano uh, uh, perspective? Is to consider multiple functionalities. We have two bacteria strains tested in this, uh, in this case. To generate compound performance indicators, which will be very helpful to uh, compress the dimensionality of the multiple space dimensions. Consider safe, safety, sustainability, functionality, and cost all together simultaneously. And uh, connect the KDFs and the KPIs, as I, I shown you before. Provide simultaneous multi-optimization. And consider also the physical chemical properties of the address nanoforms, synthesized nanoforms, which will imply specific KPIs values in terms of toxicity, in terms of cost, in terms of all the performance that we are addressing, and then to identify the connections among them. <clears throat> this is the case. Uh, I want to present a simple case just to visualize better what are the concepts. So these are the, the two KDF, the EC versus AG, silver, and the sodium hydroxide versus silver um, components in the synthesis recipe. We test only six points, of course, with replicas because fair data and uh, reliable data has to be addressed and will operate all the necessary testing, which are not infinite. We can quantify here what is the cost and the time because once we address the KPIs, we know what we have to do and how many tests we have to perform in order to get reliable data with of course, uncertainties. So those are uh, the KDF. Those are the, the, this is selected as environmental key performance indicator, the CO2 emissions, cost of the synthesis, zeta potential, diameter uh, with the TEM and pH, uh, where are the physical chemical properties. And then we have the uh, key decision factors, which is uh, referring to the process itself which will be used to, to, make, to create compound KPIs. And then here are the, uh, the functionalities, okay, and the toxicity tests. Here is what we get in terms of the three dimension KPIs. So it's a multi 
antibacterial functionality, which is the combination of the functionality for the Staphylococcus aureus and uh, Escherichia coli bacterial strain. We also included the cost to develop uh, that specific synthesis, which are many synthesis, are infinite synthesis possible here in the, this is the decision space, and the sustainability. So we have CO2 emissions which are corresponding to each point in this space, and also the safety uh, parameter, the safety KPI, which is a human toxicity potential. So you see that the responses are not uh, aligned. So there are conflicts where I have a yeah very high functionality here. Yeah, I have uh, quite low uh, uh, safety parameter here. So how to do that? How to decide? Let's clash these multi spaces in one thing. Okay, which keeps all the information. We are not averaging out, so we are not really uh, uh, smearing or, or reducing the information content. And we get this is the decision space. You remember, Eck versus Silver, NOH versus AG. So those are the set of um, best multi safe and sustainable by design options those are options these are not decisions these are options and each point corresponds to specific uh, uh, indicators safety environment functionality again safety again um, um, environment and still functionality this is the projection of the multi-space here we have the full picture Okay, I try to make it simple in three dimensions, just to visualize. And by, say, clicking one point in this space, we are returned a point in this decision space. Okay. More than that, we, we, we do have data also on the physical chemical, which are associated to the key decision factors and to the KPIs. So each point in all diagrams are connected to specific uh, diameter of nanoparticles and zeta potential that we may obtain. More than that, we also have uh, the pH, okay, here. Those are all physical chemical properties associated to the key performance indicators. So that may, may be useful maybe to connect the PCM with uh, the toxicity profile or the cost profile or the environmental impact profile of our uh, materials, nanomaterials. And maybe we could provide good indications at scientific level to make hypotheses to see what are the main factors which are influencing uh, the se selected KPI, toxicity, oxidative stress, genotoxicity, whatever. So please keep in mind that we can use as a KPI different uh, indicators which are just pertaining to one dimension, so the safety one. We can do, we, we can work this algorithm at multi level. This is the power of it. And uh, to conclude, okay, what are the features and plus points of industrial relevance? Okay, in contrast to different algorithms basing on uh, big data, we need a minimum amount of experimental, I would say, reliable, reproducible data. Otherwise, we will have a runaway and drifts in our answers. And uh, we can rely upon a finite number of samples, specific case, of course. Uh, this allows to minimize development time and cost. Co uh, time to market is shortened. It's a quantitative based tool. So we will compare relatively to what we are doing with our, our experiments. But we get answers, numeric answers, values, which can be compared with other tests, with other benchmark in terms of safety, in terms of sustainability, etc. Uh, this is a multi-level, a multi-criteria decision uh, analysis uh, tool that uh, enables also SSBD scalability through different life cycle stages, not only synthesis, incorporation, 
all use phase, simulation, etc. And that then it's very important to stress the point that this is based on relative comparisons, which is safety and sustainability based on best available technologies now and here. Uh, the suggested SSBD solutions may be compared uh, within the same framework and with other external solution databases, etc. Final considerations, if I have 30 seconds, no? Okay, okay, okay. sorry. Uh, wow, this is the future. So <laughs> we want to address and to answer to one of the first nano talks um, um, uh, meetings, uh, I was put a question, why are you dividing uh, safety and sustainability? Yes, because we cannot do better than that. One of the aims of the Integrano project is to integrate uh, with nano-specific impact categories in order to uh, benefit from the framework, which is developed already in the life cycle assessment, and to address ecotox and human tox at the same level and then integrate data and uh, more and more and more, enhancing the dimensionality of analysis and uh, have more power in computation. So I thank you all partners within Azina, Integrano, and uh, all of you for the attention and the European Commission for funding uh, these two excellent uh, projects, very challenging ones. So uh, be aware that the longer is the presentation, shorter is the Q&A. So we only can afford one question. Yes. <laughs> Thanks for a very interesting uh, presentation. Um, I was wondering, you talked about maximizing um, all the various KPIs. Is it possible to perhaps amend that slightly to maybe set absolute limits on a certain one? So perhaps you say, not classified as hazardous and just set that and have it as an absolute limit and then optimize perhaps a fewer number of KPIs within that design space. Absolutely, it makes sense. This one, one of the main issues within Azina meetings, even in Venice, I remember I, I proposed to set thresholds or to have values for thresholds. And it was kind of a scandal because who knows the threshold? I mean, who takes the responsibility of, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, I understand for safety, uh, but you can, in any case, set thresholds. It will be even easier because you will somehow cut off part of your decision space and you say, okay, in this domain, you are saying whatever you want to do. Of course, you will want to maximize functionality, but stay in that region. That's that's possible. Yes, of course. This is the easiest thing. Thank you for the rest of this. Thank you very much again, uh, Massimo. Thank you for the discussion. And thank you for your presence. Um, safety by process control goes one step further from safety by design. And this is not an arrogant statement. It is just based on the fact that it uh, process control is based on the assumption that the optimal conditions for producing safe and within the desired functionalities specifications product have already been defined. So we have the optimal conditions, but when the process runs, many problems may arise. These problems may arise in the form of disturbances. These disturbances could be, for example, changes, unexpected changes in the concentrations, the temperature of the environment, some leaks, fouling in the process, and so on and so forth. So this is where control takes uh, part and uh, has to ensure that the process is maintained within the limits that uh, is first designed for, meaning that the product retains the desired characteristics. And it does this by automatically adjusting the process manipulated variables. In our case, the manipulated variables are just before the process, and these are actually flows and uh, the temperature in some cases. So we first uh, give a brief description of the Sabidoma process, and uh, there will be a demonstration of two modeling platforms. One is for the model of the process itself, and the other will be for the control loop, the control system uh, that actually regulates the whole process. And we conclude with some details on the process model. There will be some videos, uh, some um, animations, so I hope 
it's not uh, very tiring. So this is the sabidoma process. It is actually a continuous process for uh, the production of cellular nanoparticles. It has one nucleation stage and uh, four growth stages. And the reactants are uh, introduced in the process through pump A, pump B, and these are silver nitrate, sodium citrate, and tannic acid, reducing agents. Silver nitrate is also introduced to the system through pump C, which actually has to have four times the, flows, the flow of pump A. At the end of the process, we can measure, estimate the size and the concentration of the nanoparticles by UV VIS sensor. And in line with this is also the Hisense flow cell in which we can measure the possible disturb disruption of the membrane, which is linked actually to the toxicity of the, uh, the product. So first of all, a model for this process has been developed and has been included in uh, this uh, simulink based, MATLAB simulink based platform, um, which is used for making various, uh, the test of various scenarios, operating scenarios. Uh, actually, this could be stated as in silico experiments. Let's have a closer look to the, uh, this platform. So this is the simulating model of the process. If, if we can enlarge it, uh, we can see here these uh, input variables, concentration, flow, flow rates, and temperature. And for uh, at the end, we have the output variables. And we are most more interested in the meter di uh, mean diameter and also the TOC score. The user has the possibility to view all the current flows of the inputs. And the main part, of course, of the platform is a control panel in which the user defines several changes to the process and tests the output. In this first part, we introduce, the user can introduce changes to the input concentrations. The first uh, line is for the initial value of the concentrations. The next line is the final value of the concentrations. And the middle line is where we define the time where this step change take, takes place. Same for uh, happens for the flow rates. So actually, many changes can be introduced, actually an infinite number. And uh, here we make uh, an example. With example, with uh, two changes of uh, flow rates, you can see it's uh, points one and four, and uh, two changes for the concentrations. It is numbers two and three. So these changes take place uh, in the order that they appear here, it's one, two, three, and four on the axis of time, as you see it. So you will see now an um, actual recording of the running of the platform, where we can see how these uh, changes are first introduced and then how the process responds. As described, the first change is for the first uh, flow, it's for the flow of uh, silver nitrate at the third growth stage, and it happens at uh, five minutes. It is it's an increase of uh, flow. The next change is uh, for the concentrations of sodium citrate and tannic acid. For sodium citrate, the concentration will be increased at time, I think, 15 minutes. And for the tannic acid, it will be decreased at uh, 35, I believe, yes, 35 minutes um, in the axis of time. We have one last uh, change to introduce to the process. And this is the flow of uh, sodium citrate and tannic acid um, at the beginning, of course, at the uh, pump B of um, the process. This change happens far later, 65 minutes, and uh, it will be 
actually decrease of uh, the flow. So after we have this, uh, defined all the changes, we run the process, we run the simulation, and what we get here is actually the response for the two variables of interest. The one on the top is the diameter, mean diameter, and the other one follows is the TOC score. Of course, the runtime is far less than the real time because, of course, the simulation it is fast forward. So now let's uh, have a closer look to the results. This is the response of the mean diameter. We have also the response of the TOC score. And we can see the times, there's a vertical dotted lines where the changes have been implemented. So here we can see that uh, the output variables respond to every change of the input variables. And, but this does not happen uh, instantaneously for all of them. So it happens instantly when we change the flow rate because it does not require time to witness the change at the outlet of the reactor. But of course, it takes time equal actually to the rest of the time of the reactor because it's a plug flow reactor to witness the changes for the concentration, uh, concentration levels. So we have built a model of the process and we have tested for various scenarios. And then we use this model for the, of the process to build the control uh, system, the control loop, which is actually included in a second platform that is used to actually uh, regulate the process. So on the left, we have the integrated uh, part of the, the process, the system. So we can see this is the model of the process, and this is where the actual process should be placed in. And then we have in the feedback loop, the controller, which receives the um, deviations from the desired actual uh, values of the outputs and make some decisions about what should be the flow rates that will correct these uh, errors. We can also see the points where the UV sensor for measurement of uh, the size and the high sense for the membrane disruption should be located uh, within the, this uh, framework. This is the platform for uh, controlling the system. The only input that uh, we have to define is here is actually the set points, and the rest is uh, something that we can monitor. But there is also some changes that we can make, and this pertain to the limits of uh, the input variables, the flows, up and low limit, and also the limits for the output variables. The time that in the toxicity. First, we're interested in how this uh, mod, this uh, control, <laughs> okay, this uh, control system reacts to disturbances if uh, it regulates the system. So we introduce a disturbance here, and it's actually a disturbance that says that we have 20% increase in the concentration of sodium citrate tannic acid at time. So when time stops. Uh, recording, not waste time here. It's raining, sorry. Okay, so here we introduce the change at time 10 minutes. We introduce a 1.2 increase 
to 20% for both concentrations, sodium citrate tannic acid. And then we see how this uh, process uh, responds. Because this is fast, fast forward as before. And just one comment or two comments about the, um, these responses. We already discussed the disturbance. The disturbance has the effect after, of course, uh, there is this time of the reactor. The, diameter deteriorates, but then the controller takes action by increasing the flow rate of silver nitrate and decreasing the flow rate of sodium citrate to act actually return this value at the set point, the desired one. So there's also one, um, one more example with set point um, tracking, but uh, maybe if you're interested, we can discuss it uh, later. Thank you. Thank you very much, Athanasios. I know how difficult it is to <laughs> condense all our knowledge in only 10 minutes of presentation, but um, really appreciate it. Uh, so we have some time for questions. Maybe Blanca? Hi. Um, thank you very much for the nice presentation. Um, I'm, I'm wondering about the TOC score. Uh, can you build a little bit more on that? Maybe I missed it, but how do you, where do you get it from and what is behind this, this word? Thank you. Okay, okay. If it's, if it's a problem, I will uh, try to answer the uh, best way possible. So we had we had several uh, experiments performed by uh, our colleagues uh, in Sabidoma that uh, actually linked the size or the particle size distribution, to be more exact, with the, the so-called toxicity score that has been calculated. It's a combination of toxicity scores uh, calculated by our, our colleagues uh, in MISFIC. So we had this data. Based on this data, we built, we built uh, um, uh, polynomial, uh, uh, sorry, a regression with the regression, and uh, it resulted to a polynomial that uh, linked the diameter to the TOC score. So this is why you say you you saw the diameter going hand in hand with the toxicity score, because actually it is uh, monotonically decreasing both of them, or decreasing. But then, if I understood this properly, this says that the, you know, the larger the diameter, the more toxicity, is it? Yes. It, but this is, is that, I mean, I would have expected the other way around. I was just wondering, yes. but anyway. That's yeah. we had we had many discussions based on, on yeah. this okay. issue because, uh, of course, which is more toxic? It's uh, diluted the, with the higher size. We're not, but we had only eight or so, maybe. But, but the top Data. score comes from Miss Week, yeah? So, okay, then I, I know where it's coming from. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Yes, we have time for another question. It's really a comment. I think it's the fact that the model is working and correcting uh, a change, so to speak, rather than the actual mechanism of toxicity. I mean, once whatever the mechanism toxicity is, it can be the other way around. It's the point the model actually is operable and works. I think that's the point. Indeed, because provided that you have the right model for the toxicity, it works. Of course. That's true. I'm with the team. <laughs> uh, just a, a quick uh, uh, comment here. Uh, the talk score, uh, is a, a function of uh, uh, combining five different high throughput toxicity endpoints. And the lower it is, the higher the toxicity. So uh, just a clarification. So um, that's what we, uh, ideally it would be best to measure high throughput toxicity two times in a second in order to do that continuously and continuously of uh, interven making interventions in the process. Because that's not possible, we try to uh, have an inferential sensor that draws from what can be measured fast and draws conclusions on what can be measured really slow. It takes days to get the results. So that's the best possible. The moment, as 
Thanasi uh, said, uh, high throughput toxicity testing becomes really fast. We will integrate it and we'll be really happy. In the until then, we have to use the best models that can be made. So thank you very much again, Athanasios. Um, yes, uh, let's welcome now Thomas Chamberlain from the University of Leeds in the UK. He will present the self self optimization of non toxic uh, spherical silver nanoparticles in continuous flow. Thank you very much. Um, hopefully I might answer some of the questions from the last talk as to where the data comes from. So um, I'm not, I think it's probably a better way around doing it than, than, than I thought it might. Um, hopefully. But, perfect. So yeah, I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the work we've done at the University of Leeds, um, essentially providing the data um, for the, the talk you saw previously. Um, I'm going to go through some of this was covered before, but I'm going to sort of highlight the bits that are important or pertinent to, to me. Um, I think the bottom part of this is really important to us, and it would be, be keen to develop uh, and make decisions based on actual scientific evidence and data. So the more data we can collect, and I heard something previously which I wasn't quite sure about, for me, the more data you can collect, the better and more informed your models can be. Um, I work with the pharmaceutical industry a lot and they, they have very limited amounts of material. So we are always trying to maximise what we learn from the data and the material we use. But clearly, the more data you can generate and the quicker you can generate it and the more intelligent you can generate it, the better your models will end up being, I think. And um, so this is again, I'm not going to go over this at all, but the idea of this is um, to generate or design materials, screen them for toxicity to inform the design of materials and, and aim to to minimise the toxicity of materials as we develop them. And again, um, there's some lovely diagrams that I've ripped from the Savvy Doma project, but the idea is to, to make our materials, quantify their toxicity, and then inform the modelling uh, with as much as we can. So online measurements are something I'm really interested in, but we do a lot of offline measurements, both in terms of toxicity, cell line screening, etc., and detailed characterisation of materials. Um, the, the project had a variety of different taste cases, um, I'm interested in nanomaterials and nanoparticles. So we looked at copper, gold, titania. If we go to the next slide, we've looked at and developed continuous processes for copper oxide, uh, titania. But today I'm going to talk about silver nanoparticles and then incorporating the synthesis of silver nanoparticles in continuous flow with online analytics. So UV vis to understand something about the conversion of the reactions and the size and shape of the nanoparticles. And then I'm going to explain a little bit about how we measure toxicity or membrane disruption um, and quantify that and turn that into a toxicity score in continuous flow. So this is what I'm going to talk to you today about continuous flow synthesis of silver nanoparticles and using online analysis to understand their, their toxicity. So um, just a bit of a background of the approaches that we use in my group and um, before that in terms of self-optimizing of processes and um, this is a video that was part of an EPSRC UK funded project on pharmaceuticals but it has exactly the same context we integrate and, and use all of our um, pumps and systems to integrate and introduce all the reagents. We, we control the ratios of reagents by setting the set points and we um, inform our chemical reaction that way. We then pump it through a continuous flow reactor where we can control the synthesis conditions, temperature, et cetera. And then we monitor them or measure them online, in this case using GC analysis to relate the initial concentrations and conditions to an output. And then the computer then takes that information and relates the conditions that we gave it to the output. And then depending on what you get the computer to do, it will generate another set of conditions. Those conditions will be changed and then you will run a second reaction and you get a second relationship between input conditions and output objective. And then you go round and round and round in a circle. Now what you can get the computer to do and what you can use machine learning and algorithms to do is a variety of different things. You can get it to map the space or the chemical space. And we saw some lovely design of experiments and chemical space mapping earlier. So you can design and um, a generate a set of experiments to look at the relationship between uh, properties and their outputs. You can do this, which is a pharmaceutical example, uh, where you actually optimize the yield of the reaction by changing all the conditions and using that to work out the yield. Uh, and, or you can do something that we saw in the previous slide where we can map Pareto front. So you can map two objectives and you can get a trade-off curve 
between maximizing two separate objectives. And again, that's really important for pharmaceutical companies because they can make informed decisions about yields um, at the cost of environmental impact, toxicity, or cost of the chemical process. So just to sort of show you the importance of that, um, this is the reactor that we have in the University of Leeds, and this is what they look like in real terms. We have chemical um, chemicals introduced through pumps and mass flow controls. In this case, this is a hydrogenation of a pharmaceutical, and then we have a packed bed of catalyst. Then we have online GC and HPLC. And what you can basically do for this reaction here, you can look at this reduction, and then you can map the chemical space. So in this case, we did 25 experiments. On the right-hand side, which was introduced nicely in one of the previous talks, this is the chemical space of the reaction. Each dot that's appearing is the next experiment that the algorithm has decided. And eventually the algorithm hones into a maximum in the bottom right hand corner and you can see that you can get a maximum yield at higher temperatures lower concentration of reagent and higher flow rate and what that tells you is information about the chemical process so how we worked that and we've seen this slide before from Thanasis, but this is our silver nanoparticle flow setup you can see that again we have uh, pumps that we can control in an automated way we have online analytics in terms of UV vis. There's a nice video that you might have seen outside. We have a three-dimensional um, 3D printed scaffold for the tubular reactor. We pop it in a heated oil bath, and then we introduce our reagents with the different pumps. And you can see that the different flows are introduced. Um, there's the silver, ni um, silver nitrate and then the reductant. They're preheated in, in the um, oil bath, and then they come out of the oil bath at a fixed temperature. They're mixed. At this T piece, in this case it's a CIJ mixer, then the nanoparticles are formed, they evolve over time within the temperature of the oil bath, and then we can add extra amounts of silver nitrate to control the temperature, so to control the size and the shape of the nanoparticles. So you can see that we have four different points where we add silver nitrate, and again, after this is run through, you'll see that the final product comes through a UV vis um, sensor, and that can be used to quantify um, conversion of the material and also the, the size and the shape. Um, and again, I won't labour this too much, but all this data we pass on to our colleagues. Um, the, the reactor is pretty stable, so we make nanoparticles of a constant size and shape if we keep the reaction fixed. We can also explore the relationship between the flow rate and the diameter of the nanotubes and the temperature of the reactor, so we can control the size and shape of the nanoparticles by changing the input variables, which is quite important. And then this is something that probably would have been useful five minutes ago, but this is the online um, membrane disruption sensor that we have at the University of Leeds, and we've managed to couple that in flow. So what we managed to do is we put this at the end of our material, we run our reaction, make a nanoparticles, then when UVVis says that we're at steady state, we chop a portion or a sample of that material into the membrane disruption sensor, and that gives us a tox score or an amount of membrane disruption there is for that particular set of conditions. So we use the UV vis input and we use the top score generated by the membrane sensor to then inform our chemical model. So I'm not going to go through this quickly, but this is basically what it looks like. We have our, our system on the right. We have a UV vis gate in the middle. So what happens is we give it a set of conditions and it then runs those conditions. Once the um, system is run and at steady state, UV vis then tells our second system to trigger um, a measurement to be done. So you can see here that when the nanoparticles are formed, we get a nice signal from that. Um, when that steadies or, or reaches nice steady state, that then triggers the um, second system, which takes a sample and gives us a toxicity measurement. And again, we can do screening, and that's what we've done so far. We've done the design of experiments to map the relationship between conditions and um, the toxicity, but you could imagine we could do optimization to make the least toxic nanoparticles. You could imagine we could explore toxicity versus a set of conditions or throughput, etc. There's the sort of machine learning world is your oyster now that we have this set up working. So this is what we've done and some results to sort of show you. This is a design of experiment chemical space mapping. On the right hand side is the peak suppression. So that's essentially the measure of the toxicity. The size of the ball is the size of the nanoparticle. And then all the other conditions that we put into the synthesis are in the cube. Um, you can see that there's quite a lot of peak suppression in these measurements, so quite a lot of our material uh, is giving us a lot of membrane disruption. If we map that, and that's what you can do with design of experiments, you can map the relationship between the different conditions. 
you're looking for a nice green bit. You can see there's not much green at the moment, so we need to work on making less toxic nanoparticles. And what we also did is we took our samples and then we put them through a dialysis or man managed to centrifuge them and remove the excess uh, reductant and surfactant. And we looked at the pure peak suppression of the nanoparticles offline. And you can see this is that. And green is much better than red in this case. So you can see we've actually found some regions where the nanoparticles we're making don't exhibit much or any toxicity at all. So this is quite a nice result. Um, it is possible to do um, purification nanoparticles in flow or continuously. So that's something that we could integrate into our system if we we're interested in that. And you can see again the relationship here. We have some big, nice green regions where we could work if we we're interested in developing this process further. So a complete, that's a complete whistle stop tour of what we're doing. You can imagine now that we have our platform working, we can create an amazing amount of data for our colleagues to inform their models. Um, the nice thing is that silver nitrate is very cheap compared to some of the pharmaceuticals I use. So actually we can create quite a lot of data in quite a short space of time. So work that's left to do in the last month, and while we're not in Vienna eating nice cake, we can explore looking at some single objective uh, optimizations where we optimize the lowest toxicity. I would really like to do some multi-objective work where we balance toxicity versus nanoparticle size and space-time yield of the chemical process. And also, as you can imagine, now we've got titanium and copper oxide syntheses in flow. We can just couple those syntheses up to our system and generate a huge amount of data. Uh, and obviously with data, uh, one of the most important things to think about when you've got data is to then try and apply them uh, to generate some mechanisms which will help us scale up these processes. Understand. So that's me done. Lovely when someone stands up because you know you have to finish. But I'd just like to thank all these people, especially the three postdocs, so uh, Matt, uh, Jellico, Will Stokes and, uh, and Matt Simmons because they've done all this work and coupled these things together. So thank you to them especially. Thank you very much. So I'm happy that the message have been understood <laughs> for the next session. <laughs> so we have some time for uh, questions. Florian Part from Boko, uh, Vienna. A very interesting approach. I uh, know similar uh, approaches uh, for synthesizing quantum dots, for example. Yeah. But in your case, you used uh, UVVs for uh, for these inline measurements. Are you were also coupling your system, for example, to nano tracker analysis, which would be also feasible inline for inline measurements? Um, um, yes, we have a huge number of different chemical systems. So we work with polymers, we look with um, liposomes, we work with quantum dots ourselves. We actually have GL uh, DLS in line. And for this project, we use UVVs because that was one of the things that we had early on. But we have a, a huge number of inline analytics sort of within our compass. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. We haven't used NanoTracker actually, but we have, we've used DLS for similar. Okay, that was similar. Things, but and then the last question: Do you have any high throughput toxicity screening tests in mind, or which one do you apply? Um, I don't. I'm sure people in the project do. <laughs> but yeah, I think as long as we can generate a huge number of samples and understand the relationship between the conditions we use to generate them and what we make, and, and we can reassure our colleagues that it's reproducible, then I think we can pass those samples on. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I can, again, I can clarify just a little bit about the high throughput. So the, the way that goes is that all of these reaction variance temperature syntheses are evaluated separately under high throughput in diverse cell lines. In this case, it was the beast to be model with or without serum. And so that is a reference data set that they look upon and which they have where they where they go in and it gives a sort of a baseline idea from traditional cell culture to these online measurements. So that's and it will be presented more on Thursday for those who are there. And I, I will give a small presentation. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a very interesting presentation, especially for someone who was in a previous life, a process chemist. Um, I was just wondering, uh, is this applicable only to products that are intended to be synthesized um, on scale using a continuous flow, or can it be also applied to batch process? Is, and if it's the latter, I'd be interested in what you said at the very last comment about how it can be used for predicting effects on scale up. Um, I don't think anyone ever stops being a process chemist. 
and whenever I chat to them. Um, no, we have a couple of projects where we're looking at collecting as much data as we possibly can at lab scale to create or generate models and then use those models to predict what type of reactors, batch flow, continuous flow, um, large different batch reactors would be best to do that scale up. So no, absolutely not. We actually have some lab scale batch systems. We have some lab scale CSTR systems that we generate the data from. And the idea is then to understand the, the mechanism well enough that we can then put it through our digital twin to predict scale up conditions. Um, as part of the IPRD where I work, and with the companies that I work with, we actually have several large scale pilot facilities that will then validate those that that prediction upon and hopefully go around in a feedback loop. As you can imagine, it's it's hard to test things at pilot scale for very long and generate much data. So it's it, it's better to do it at the lab scale. But no, absolutely batch is not well not dead, but it, it it's certainly an option for some things, obviously. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Thomas. Uh okay, I think it's time to start to end the break. Please take a seat. So I hope everybody is ready that we continue with the next session after the coffee break. Now the focus will really be on the case studies and also industrial success stories. As I said in the morning, all projects did have case studies and industry partners, and we picked at least some and show you some highlights from there. So um, I will already introduce the first speaker. We start with Apostolo Salmotunidis from Laita Technological Center in Spain, and he will talk about success and limitation in the implementation of SPD interventions on Sabina case study for 3D printing products and processes. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you, the organizers, for giving us the presentation, uh, the, the possibility to present uh, this work here. Great. So, as you have uh, also seen uh, and listened later uh, this day, uh, Sabina project main output, it will be uh, to provide the industry with uh, user-friendly, customized and integrative guidance platform to support the development of safer by design nanomaterials and nano-enabled products. So the end user uh, will be able to identify potential risks and establish optimal workflows to find the optimal safe by design solution to reduce and mitigate risk as early as, as possible in the innovation process. Now, to give some of uh, the motivation of what are we going to be talking about now, uh, is in order to support the identification of Sabina exposure scenarios, uh, the potential of the inhalation exposure, uh, with sector-specific data along the different life stages, but here we will only focus on the 3D printing, uh, we will characterize and show the results and the characterization of the emissions, uh, sources and the hotspots. And in order to support uh, the development and the implementation and the validation of the Sabina Safer by Design strategies, we will identify the factors that are influencing these emissions. We will focus on the process parameters uh, with the final aim to support the end user to select the end user of the platform to select the optimal safe by design intervention in function with technical functionality of the nano enabled product. If I didn't stress that enough, I will be talking about the 3D printing process itself, but um, I will give you some a bit of a context first. So here we have the case study materials. Basically, what we have is the filament that we use as a feedstock to do the 3D printing. And we have two uh, kind of families of uh, materials. Um, see. Yeah, here we have the polycarbonate-based uh, filaments that they are loaded with single wall carbon nanotubes to give anti-static properties and, the, and the, with the application being the accessories for vacuum cleaners. And then we have another material that it's been uh, used with is the polypropylene uh, thermoplastic compound uh, that is loaded with silver nanoparticles for antibacterial properties uh, for the orthopedical applications. These uh, images are not just some nice pictures that we took, these are actually made, produced within the Sabina project uh, and how they were produced was like using this kind of machines here. So these are the 3D printers that they use the materials that we have seen before and you see that we are using different types of materials that they have different technical characteristics, different technical characteristics in terms of set of parameters that uh, they can use, like temperature, velocity, 
diameter of the filament, etc. This is why we need all of those or different ones. And just to highlight that these are commercial ones, so they're uh, available uh, quite broadly. And the process parameters that we variate and we study are the nozzle temperature, which is basically the printed head, the head that is moving around. Uh, we can set the, the temperature there and the infill density. So as you can see, for the same geometry of a certain object, we can have different densities of the material in terms of um, how we would fill in uh, the materials. You can have like 20%, 50%, 70%, etc. Good. <clears throat> Going to some results of the uh, emission source characterization. Here we have the emissions in terms of particle number concentrations. These are average concentrations with their standard deviations of uh, when we variate the nozzle temperature. So here we had 250, 270, 290 uh, degrees, and we see how they're variating uh, their emissions in terms of particle number concentration. And also when we variate for a certain specific temperature, 270 degrees, the infill density. So here we also tried with a lower infill density to print with the uh, polycarbonate uh, based filaments. Uh, we see that the concentration may reach up to uh, millions of particles per cubic centimeters for the uh, highest temperature, which we consider this to be uh, the optimal temperature from the point of view of the process uh, engineering. Um, and uh, all um, the different variation and all the different processes, they released uh, particles, process generated particles that they were in the nanoscale, as we can see here in their size distribution. Now, what happens if we tune now uh, their uh, nozzle temperature? What we have seen is that we managed to obtain uh, a reduction uh, of the emissions in terms of particle number concentration. And uh, here we have the uh, nano enable filament, while here we have just the conventional one. <clears throat> and for both cases, we can see similar, similar trends uh, that they follow and similar patterns. And basically, if we plot this uh, in order to, to be able to obtain a relation between the nozzle temperature as a process parameter and the emissions in terms of particle number concentration, we can see that they follow an exponential uh, relation. So up to when they reach, when you lower the temperature up to 200 degrees, you cannot reach a plateau, while when you're starting to raising it, this is exponentially uh, increasing uh, the emissions uh, up to orders of magnitudes of difference. All right, just to quantify a bit uh, what is the reduction of the uh, emissions that we might achieve, uh, we consider as an initial state a comparison with a safe by design uh, approach application. So what we could say a safe by design approach is that we uh, tune specific parameters by a specific uh, amount. So we can reach up to 95% of reduction of emissions in terms of particle number concentration if we reduce the nozzle temperature by 20 degrees and we lower the infill. Uh, however, if we only reduce the infill density, we only uh, reach up to 51% of reduction. And only with 20%, sorry, only with 20 uh, degrees of uh, reduction, it goes up to 90%. And with 40 degrees, 95% again. So we can see that the nozzle temperature is the main uh, driver, the main, uh, let's say, the most efficient uh, parameter to be tuned in order to reduce emissions. But if you combine it with the infill density, you might have a constructive results, although you cannot average, you cannot sum it up exactly. Right, and this is kind of a practical application now to how these uh, emissions might impact the inhalation exposure. Here we have an open printer, and what we did, uh, let's say, uh, this is a real case scenario that uh, we have uh, simultaneously monitored the emissions in the emission source and then in the worker area. You might consider this as near fill and far fill. With the green, we have uh, uh, the near fill with the black, like let's say the, the far field, and we see a clear impact uh, of the emissions as fugitive emissions that uh, they can impact the inhalation exposure of other workers that they are doing other activities some meters away in the same uh, area. And uh, we can provide the user with the, let's say, solution if you tune your process parameters by 95%, as we have seen before, you might be able to reduce your emissions in a level that they will not pose uh, a concern or high concern anymore. 
Uh, and what about the functionality? Because we might be changing the process parameter as we like in order to reduce emissions. However, <clears throat> the most important thing is that our final non-enabled product will be functional as well. Right, so we have measured the uh, resistivity in terms to define, uh, in order to define the anti-static properties. And here we also have as a comparison the, the um, conventional polymer. And we see that indeed the uh, single wall carbon nanotubes that we were using, they are giving uh, this anti-static property. So we just not add them for fun there. And also when we were keeping reducing the temperature, these are all in the uh, anti-static rate. So these are values that we can give also to, to, to the end user and they can decide how they fit uh, the purposes of their nano enabled products. Right, uh, and to conclude, uh, some successes is that the ultrafine uh, particle emissions during the 3D printer can be controlled by tuning the process parameters like the nozzle temperature, which lower temperatures will lead to lower emissions, lower infill density will, low, uh, will lead to lower emissions, their combination will lead to even lower emissions. And the technical function or the static properties in the specific case of the produced non-enable product has been maintained after the application of the uh, safe by design approach. Now, something that we are also have seen is that the different printers have different modifications with uh, enclosures, integrated extractions or not. So additional risk mitigation measures like engineering control may further complement and uh, enhance the efficiency of the safe by design measures. And also potential association can be made also with the sustainability aspects because um, you know, lower temperature will have uh, less energy input, lower infill density will have less material use, etc. However, there are some limitations here um, because the different safe by design strategies will be needed to address uh, the necessities of different life stages. And I will just uh, mention here that the nozzle temperature and the infill density do not become very relevant when you consider the stage of the formulation of the filament and the manufacturing of the filament. Right there, we will need some different approaches there. So there is an optimal also combination of the safe by design aspects that can be realistically applied uh, without hindering the technical function and the characteristic of the final uh, non-enabled product. Uh, because we might play around as we want, we, but we cannot reduce uh, as we like the, uh, uh, the emission, or we cannot change the tune, the parameters in order to reduce emissions. Uh, if we, in the end, instead of having this kind of uh, 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 aimed product is for the goal that we were aiming we have something different that it will not serve the commercial necessities anymore finally i would like to acknowledge all the partners of sabina and sabina for the founding and thank you all for your attention perfect perfectly in time very well managed uh, we have time for one question only one question you had in the in the past also one with non-activity. Uh, what does non-activity for the printer mean? It's not moving, it's not heated, or what does it mean? Very well, thanks. I, I had to run, so I didn't explain that. Yeah, uh, actually we we use the, the printer in the heating state, but uh, without extruding uh, any material. So no, it's not moving, but it is heating, but no material is in contact there. So there might be some uh, residuates there that may, might get released, but as you can see, uh, because we also compare it with uh, plain background values, there was not much different from no activity to plain background. So it's, it can be considered. Yeah. In, 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 sorry, it can be considered as, as as a background. And which temperature have you heated it to up to 250 or 200? No, no, no. You, we will burn it out without material like this. No, it can. It, it has to be lower. It depends on the, it depends on the printer, but it cannot go such high without actually performing the extruding the extraction problem. Okay. Because also process. with the pure printer, it could have an influence of the temperature in this case. That also the printer it, itself or the head is emitting. So it might, it might as well, but otherwise the printer by itself, if you just heat it up, it would burn. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So we can't, we couldn't do it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Great. Uh, because we're short in time, I have to continue, but Jesus, please uh, get in touch with uh, Tolis later. The next speaker, thank you very much again. Very, very nice presentation. Next speaker is Marty Busquets from Applied Nanoparticles SL in Spain, and he will talk about real life transfer of SSPD platform to industry, coupling online screening and characterization to a continuous flow silver nanoparticles production line. Exactly, <laughs> which, if uh, in summary, is uh, giving the perspective of a nanoparticle producer that is receiving technology, SSPD technology developed in Sabidoma and, and uh, how was the transfer and how was 
in the impact and the, and the results. Uh, there's been already four presentations on Sabinoma, so you know more or less what, what, what's, what, what's that about. Just as a reminder, Sabinoma takes an approach to the SSBD challenge as to be a, a control system approach. I mean, it's one of the legs. For sure, there are many uh, processes uh, that, that, that design itself. But uh, if you control the system, if you know, if you are sure that you always get the same and you have this same product assessed in toxicity, then you are safe. Uh, and the sooner you know any deviations from the from from the specs, uh, the sooner you can you can moderate it and you can uh, avoid um, uh, any harm and, and, and any risk. And also spending time and reagents and 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 and, and energy if it's a heated uh, uh, a heated process, a heated process. And also this technological approach is based on uh, putting the screening on the production point. And there are four four industrial cases, and I'm going to present the case study of the synthesis of silver nanoparticles to be introduced in uh, in conductive inks to be printed for printed electronics. This is some of the products that we produce. First, uh, a bit of what we do. We are a spin-off from the from three Catalan institutes, and the major of them, or to highlight the Catalan Institute of Nanotechnology, and actually we are a spin-off of Victor Puentes Group. It's here on the in the audience, and uh, we've been already around for more than 10 years, and our core business is the synthesis of highly monodispersed colloids, uh, inorganic nanoparticles colloids, and I put a stress on the colloids because we decided since inception not to work with powders for exposure reasons, so we, we go really into highly concentrated co colloids to avoid the, the, the powder phase, even if they have to be introduced in a matrix afterwards, is our approach. Uh, high stability, because if you work at high concentrations, you need high stability uh, and at affordable prices. And, 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 and we give also consulting services. And here, how, how we can achieve this high monodispersity that, that I talk about is through the seeded growth approach. The growth approach is starting with seeds, as much more dispersed as you can, and then doing a lot of growth steps. So the smaller ones grow faster than the bigger ones. And then you go site focusing at the end. And this is our strategy. And uh, the higher the money dispersity, the higher the quality and, and, and the performance. And this is an approach started by Victor also. And yeah, the, the, it is one of the seminal references on, on, on goal nanoparticle synthesis. It's approaching the, the 2000 citations. And it's this approach of starting with the nucleation and then keep growing to steps, adding a bit, a bit of, uh, more of, uh, of gold in, 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 the, in this case. And here you can track the growth of, of the particles through the UVBs, and then uh, we sell them for for immunoassays. We conjugate uh, with the antibody of your choice on these things. But this strategy has always been uh, translated into silver synthesis, which is the case of the case study. It is also a highly cited paper, and we take this as a starting point. And in the company, what we did is not focusing just on uh, on on the academic. Uh, output of this, uh, increasing in, increasing the output of mass. So at the, uh, starting with, with this, so it's a modification of this process, but it's based on this on 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 the city group approach. Uh, and then a bit on the requirements that we gave to other partners, to leads and and, and to and to NTUA uh, on the requirements that we needed for the process in order. And then one. One was more a requirement from them that if they want, they said that to us that to put um, online high throughput characterization, we needed to to pass from our batch approach to the continuous approach. Also because if it deviates from the specs, then uh, you can stop for a while, not collecting, discarding this part, and then when it comes back to the specs, you keep uh, you keep collecting. Once if you do it in batch, once it's spoiled, it's spoiled, and you have to start again. And one of our requirements was to have a clear separation between the nucleation and the growth stages because you want different things there, different conditions. Uh, in the nucleation, we you you want super saturating conditions. The highest the the addition, the better. The highest the temperature, and the highest the the reducing environment, the better. And in the growth stage, it can be much milder conditions, lower growth, and that's much better. And you prevent the the secondary nucleation. And uh, from the process control perspective, we needed this system to control some case synthetic parameters, 
the reagents proportions, the flow rates and, and, and the temperature. And we need it because we use it to know if we are in a good path or not. Uh, the uh, an inline UVB is a uh, spectrophotometer to know which is the size of the particles at, at any time. And then as a toxicity screening module, what I want to talk about it later, uh, uh, something to screen the toxicity that was developed in our project, uh, also added here. And the four leg is the, the automated data analysis and the feedback loops to correct an, an, any deviation. And these are the three parts, and I'm going to go one by one, even if some of them have already been built. This has been presented by, 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 by Thomas Chamberlain already, the growth stages. You can see the nucleation stage is separated here on here, we want different rates here than, than on the rest. And this is already has been uh, presented. So we move to the to the highest membrane. Uh, here outside, here on, on, the, on, on the corridor, we have a stand to show this uh, highest membrane. Here, what you need to know, and I was as a summary, is that it is, it is uh, a system to evaluate, to, to mimic the membrane disruption, and it's been validated and calibrated in our project. And in, and, and in Sabidoma, we added more data to still fine-tuning it. And then, uh, and I mean, it, it relates the peak suppression to the, to, to the membrane in, in, in interaction and, and, and disruption. And then this goes to, does some the, the, the post-treatment of, of the data to end up with some limit of detection when it's uh, when they can detect that, that there's a, a disruption or not. And the third leg is is the process control itself, and this has been presented by Athanasius already uh, to link the UBBs, which is to a size. And this is actually what we got already installed uh, at our at, at our at, at our premises, which is it just predicts the mean diameter that we are going to get. The second stage. Which is the moderation and the process control, all everything that uh, Athanasius has already presented has been achieved only in silico. But the idea is to implement it also in our system, but it's not implemented yet. And then this was the transfer. Uh, this is how we have it in our labs. This is a video that you can consult outside, and maybe I have no time in the moment. And, sorry. And here it's maybe what you want to see, which is the, the, the actual impact that it has had in, in, in uh, our facilities. Here on the left, we can see what we get in the batch, in, in the batch process, which is uh, high, high monospersity, high sphericity. You can look at this and say, OK, this is pretty common. In gold, there's a lot of knowledge and in the market, a lot of highly monospersed gold. But silver, uh, you can find it, I mean, even um, bulk providers that we all know which I'm referring to. They are very, very polydispersed, not that spheric, potato-like that, that I call them. And the idea was to reproduce this high quality into the in, in into the Sabinoma system. And also here, just to note, we get a final concentration up to one milligram per milliliter, and we can produce about eight grams of silver per day. And the first version or the last version developed in Leeds before the transfer was, I mean, I was amazed because they are spherical, which is quite difficult to achieve, and not everybody can achieve it that easily. But the polyspersity was much higher if you compare these this, this two size distributions. And the output was very, very, very low, but the proof of principle was there. We were getting an output of between 20 and 30 milligrams per working day. This was very far. This was uh, transferred to our facilities. And together with leads, we changed some, some parameters based also on my expertise on what's working. Uh, we decrease a lot the tannic acid. Tannic acid is the secondary um, re reducing agent and is uh, used to get a strong reduction in the, in the nucleation. But in leads, they had to use a lot to see something. But if you put a lot of tannic acid, it's quenching the silver, and then there's few nuclei, and they grow bigger. And uh, if you want the small particles, it's very difficult. And I implemented all, all the changes, and this is what we ended up. This is one of the experiments, one of the setups that, that, that we can reproduce robustly now, and uh, we can get good, good monospersity, much, much better, good sphericity. Uh, and this is starting to be an interesting output for, for us because we, we can get up 
up to one gram per working day. We, we switch it on, and after seven hours and a half, uh, the, the working day, especially now in Spain, uh, we get about one gram. This is working in the highest condition possible of flow rate. And then just, just a last slide showing that the highest conditions give you high output, but also working with these higher rates. I, with my experience, we can see cl clearly that there's uh, and that the reaction has not been finished in the reactor. And then here, when you go to a TM, there's new nucleation on site. So uh, the yield is very low. And I can see this on the UBBs. It's something that I'm going to present on the Sabidoma meeting. Uh, there's no time here. Uh, but we can, so to reach these high outputs, maybe we are, what we're getting is uh, not completed. The reaction is not completed. And a possible solution to be something that has been designed inside the Sabidoma in a, in a deliverable, which is the strategy has been designed to be to all the models can be replicated and staked so you can have much more output. And so you can uh, go down the rates, go back to the rates where you get uh, the, when the reaction is complete and then just stack it to get much, much more output. And this is uh, our experience in the way the Sabidoma system. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marty. The next speaker, which is Alex Grigoropoulos from Creative Nano in Athens, Greece, and he will talk about promoting photocatalytic activity of sulfur-doped titanium dioxide nanoparticles, applying a safe by design modification. Thanks, Suzanne. So my name is Alex, for those of you who do not know me, I'm going to present to you very briefly how in the context of the SPD for Nano project, we developed a uh, an SPD modification for uh, reducing the toxicity of uh, titanium oxide nanoparticles while simultaneously promoting, albeit slightly, but still promoting the photocatalytic activity for the degradation of common uh, air pollutants. So Creative Nano is an SME located in Athens, Greece. We specialize in the development of uh, nanocomposite coatings, both organic and inorganic, always trying to apply SSPT uh, strategies for their synthesis. We are capable of uh, producing our nano-enabled products at pilot scale. We have a rather good set of uh, analytical um, instruments, including an SEM and a powder XRD. Uh, we are grateful to the EC for this. We are involved in four projects that are represented uh, this week in Anthos. Uh, besides SPD for Nano, that's going to be the focal point of my talk today. We are also participating in Sabidoma and Diagonal. It was just mentioned we are one of the, for the Sabidoma case, we are developing uh, now metal-based nanocomposite coatings using silicon carbide nanoparticles as a means of reinforcement to potentially replace hard chrome. Uh, similar approach, but then using graphene for diagonal. And we are also one of the end users in Nanopath, uh, where we are testing some really new, I would actually advise you to look it up, uh, technologies regarding the online monitoring of nanoparticles in, uh, for our case, in plating baths, rather challenging measurements. Uh, we can. Uh, now, for example, monitor online uh, whether the nanoparticles are uh, nicely dispersed uh, within the plating bath. For the SPD for Nano Now project, we have been developing uh, an organic coating. Practically, uh, this is a fancy word of saying a photocatalytic paint. So the idea is quite old. The technology is not new. Paints uh, where TiO2 nanoparticles uh, have been incorporated are photocatalytically active for the uh, degradation of uh, common uh, air pollutants, such as, for example, nitrogen oxides or acetaldehyde, uh, one common uh, VOC, volatile organic compound. I'm not going to go through the chemistry here. I'm not just going to say that uh, there are still two problems that must be um, addressed or, let's say, improved, not, not improved the problem, partially solved, which is uh, first that TiO2 nanoparticles do not absorb in the visible, they only absorb in the UV region of the solar spectrum. So, for example, the respective uh, paints, uh, they are not as efficient uh, indoors where the UV light is limited. And the second one is, uh, rather recently, uh, EC uh, classified uh, titanium oxide nanoparticles uh, as suspected carcinogens. This has created chaos. There are people now afraid of actually using, uh, applying sunscreen. Uh, as uh, who said that, that it's better to have uh, skin cancer than being exposed to titanium oxide. But anyway, so these are the two challenges that we need to address uh, for indoor applications. 
Uh, for the first one, we had already been developing uh, a sulfur-doped uh, titanium oxide nanoparticles, uh, pushing the absorption towards the visible. You can see here in the graph, TiO2 is not photocatalytically active based on a standardized test uh, under visible light radiation for the degradation of a, an organic dye, which is the testing molecule. Whereas the sulfur-doped titanium oxide nanoparticles are rather active, we get 62% activity. Uh, and then we decided to apply a very simple um, safe by design approach to potentially reduce their toxicity. That is the introduction of a thin silica layer surrounding the, ti the titanium dioxide nanoparticles core and uh, at three different levels of modification. So this is actually adding three, four or six percent content uh, silica surrounding the titanium oxide nanoparticles. We were very happy to see that the activity actually increased, albeit slightly, but increased. It moved to 66 and 70 percent and then partially dropped. So this is because based on TEM and DLS data, as we add more silica to cover partially the surface of the sulfur-doped titanium oxide nanoparticles, the silica layer partially restricts uh, growth, particles growth. The particles become smaller and smaller as we add more silica in our reaction mixture. You can see it here based on the DLS. Now in the nanomaterials world, usually smaller means uh, more efficient. So that's why, although we are partially covering the surface of the sulfur-doped titanium oxide nanoparticles, we do not see any drop in activity compared to the non-modified material. But this, of course, made us rather suspicious because usually when we increase activity, we also increase toxicity. So we turn to our SPD for nano partners for carrying out a lot of measurements. Uh, I don't have the time to go over them. I will just uh, point out three key findings and acknowledge the respective partners. So SEA did some really nice uh, dustiness measurements. Uh, dustiness is increased uh, upon the SPD modification. This is not unexpected since, as I just mentioned, the particles are becoming slow, smaller. Uh, but by contrast, um, cytotoxicity measurements performed by Sunum uh, suggest that no cytotoxicity was observed at least up to 4% uh, silica incorporation. So this was good. And moving into the ecotoxicity tests carried out by Tene, the results are rather characteristic. For the algae inhibition tests, the non-modified material, so the sulfur-doped TiO2 nanoparticles without any silica uh, coating, uh, they have a very low EC50, below 2 ppm. This is quite low. Whereas all the modified materials have EC50s above 100. I guess, not I guess, I think this is the threshold beyond which a nanomaterial can be classified as non-toxic or non-ecotoxic. And for the Daphne inhibition tests, the results are rather striking. As we increase the level of modification, 3, 4, 6% silica, we see the EC50s uh, increasing, eventually surpassing for uh, three, 100 for the 4% uh, modified material. So by combining the photocatalysis tests that we carried in-house with the data provided by all the partners regarding cyto and ecotoxicity, we were able to actually define the exact modification level that we need to apply to both uh, have the highest activity but also the lowest toxicity. And this was the 4% uh, modified nanoparticles. So we produced uh, upscale the synthesis of the sulfur-doped titanium oxide nanoparticles uh, where 4% silica has been incorporated as the outer layer. I guess you can call this hybrid nanoparticles. Uh, we produced the photocatalytic paint uh, at kilo scale. Uh, we, were, um, we had SEA uh, visiting our premises to do some exposure measurements. We're very happy to find out that uh, no significant emissions uh, were detected as long as we do some specific operation inside the fume hood, which was what we have already been doing. And now as the project comes to an end, we are testing the actual paint. You can see here in a similar graph depicting activity. The paint is active over multiple cycles. So I also carried some abrasion tests before and after aging. Uh, again, results are rather promising. Uh, the, we do not detect any nanoparticles in the produced aerosol upon abrasion. 
So to conclude, in the context of the SPD for Nano project, firstly, we were capable of thoroughly characterizing both our nano materials and the nano enabled product. Uh, secondly, we were able, with the help of partners, to determine the exact uh, SPT modification level, uh, moving to move forward and incorporate the nano materials inside uh, photocatalytic paint. We were very happy to find out that we are not exposed, because I am part of the working force as well. Uh, nanomaterials uh, potentially hazardous during the synthesis of the photocatalytic paint. Uh, we also got some valuable feedback by RTR. Alina presented this earlier the, uh, this morning about the cost of producing the nanomaterials, the nano-enabled product, and the cost of the modification. By the way, in our case, the modification cost is negligible because we just add the silica precursor inside our uh, nanomaterials synthesis uh, reaction mixture. And as the project SPD for Nano comes to an end, we are now testing with the help of INL the ecotoxicity of the photocatalytic paint. I would like to acknowledge all the partners in SPD for Nano, particularly those uh, whose logos I have added here. I'm pretty sure I have forgotten a couple, so my sincere apologies in advance. And uh, I hope I was on time and I'm glad to answer any questions. Perfectly in time. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, there is a question over there. Very nice talk and very interesting. <laughs> I heard it the God, first time. Voice, Thank you. <laughs> the thing is, what does MO stand for? You said MO was degraded. Ah, yeah. MO is uh, methyl orange. It's an organic methyl dye. Methyl orange. Okay. Yeah, methyl, methyl orange in proper English. Okay, yeah. okay. That's great. Yeah, thanks for the talk. Um, so you had this miracle happening that you made your particles more photoactive but less cytotoxic that's at least what i thought you understood you were surprised is it possible that the the assay itself is biased if the cytotoxic assay is biased if you have smaller particles maybe there is less dose delivered to the cells and maybe that's why you don't see the toxicity so did you control for those they delivered those all right, so uh, I do cannot answer that question because uh, I'm not an expert in carrying out cytotoxicity tests and ecotoxicity tests. I am rather confident that uh, control experiments were performed in parallel. I know for a fact, for example, that the nanoparticles were also kept in the dark and so on and so on. But I wouldn't say that tests are biased, but I would say that we do need more tests. And by the way, in my opinion, at least, the critical measurement is not the actual cytotoxicity of the nanoparticles. I mean, yeah, that, that's a, I mean, it's a success story. The key thing here is actually after being uh, integrated in the nano-enabled product. So this is now where we are focusing on. Release, uh, exposure during synthesis for the working personnel, but also for uh, potential applications and so on. Thank you, Alex. Um, just connecting to this question now. Um, in case you do this or you let perform these tests and then you bring your product to the market, um, what did you question about liabilities? Um, I mean, just to, to bring it to the next step, to understand how you as a company deal with this, that at the end you want to enter the market. And if then it comes back that maybe any kind of test might be biased, it's just an estimation. Um, what's the next steps then for you as a company? So for that particular uh, product development, we had already been discussing, this is actually quite interesting, with uh, a major uh, paint producer in Greece. The first thing I can say is that when he heard that this is kind of uh, can be used in biomedical applications, meaning, you know, he said it's going to be a nightmare to pass all the, I cannot say the Greek FDA, which one it is, but anyway, the EMA, you know, like I mean, testing. Now, for uh, any kind of uh, self cleaning, because these paints are also self cleaning properties and so on, uh, the key thing here is to uh, further optimize the synthesis beyond pilot scale to reduce the cost. Because if you move away for a niche application, like for example, a uh, hospital, then uh, I think Alina said this morning that it's like close to 10 grams per, 10 euros per gram. Okay, for a paint that costs something like 40 euros per five kilos, you understand that, you know, this 
uh, must be significantly reduced to be able to, you know, get to the market. But we're working on it. Great. Thank you very much once again, Alex. And we move on with the next speaker, Julio Gomez from Avanzar in Spain. We'll talk about implementation of safe by design and the preparation of graphene and related materials and its composite. Thank you very much. Uh, I will introduce Avanzare because uh, I think uh, Save by Design for Nano has been introduced before and probably uh, is, uh, we are uh, slightly different to the other companies because we are larger. We are uh, a medium, we, we thought that in the next few years uh, be a large company. We are a producer and we're the pioneer in the production of or graphene, in, at least in Europe, and probably uh, other uh, 2D materials. And but we are uh, specialized in the production of uh, advanced emerging functional materials. That is mainly nanomaterials and also nanointermediates. That is the way to or paving the way to go to the market. And also, it's uh, important to know that our main market, final main market, is automotive industry. Uh, we start in 100 meters and now we have 30,000 square meters in production facilities. We are continuously growing and accelerating the growth. Yes, uh, maybe I want also to remark this. We were the pioneer in 2D materials, at least in Europe. We started in two, uh, 2005, not uh, later. And in 2009, we are also the pioneer in presenting 15 years ago in, in Nanotech Tokyo, the first uh, products based on graphene materials. And, and, and we produce different graphene materials, carbon based and, no, and non carbon based, and we make different things with these materials and then we introduce in, in, in the matrix. This is the business that we don't. Uh, what we use or we base our processing, say, by design. Why? Because uh, we, we start to work with this first with Ion from Scotland. I think in, uh, more than 10 years ago, no, more uh, 13 years ago, and also with the Tene in 2013, and we have optimized different production process, different materials, and we continue with this because this is part of our work also because our main uh, consumers need to have safe materials and also have reproducible materials. And also uh, in our case, we are a company that offers to the clients imp uh, positive impact materials instead of the traditional ones. And also something extremely important for us is if no reach, no business. We are probably the first European company in the graphene consortium, rich graphene consortium. And uh, for us, it's extremely important to, to be in, uh, in rich aligned. What are our experience? We have directly six European projects in same by design or safe by sustainable by design, and at least eight related with safe by design, safe by sustainable designs, or health and safety parts. And actually, we have done more than 15 campaigns in Avanzare, optimizing different things. And for that, with the some of, of our uh, uh, collaborators are here, other has passed to other companies, but uh, we have optimized and we have now different tools to orient uh, the, our process. And also in, in health and safety, we have uh, more than 15 years working on that in graphene and other 2D materials. Uh, I think we have seven papers by other people uh, talking about our materials. Uh, what is uh, our uh, product or our case study in Save by Design for Nano? We are, our main market is automotive industry and we have focus in automotive industry. What is the potential business? The global market is 40 billion of euros. And, and, and at least 30% of this is in automotive. We just focus in automotive. In glass fiber is, uh, is 10 billion of euros and, continu and continuous growth. And the replacement of 10% of this uh, glass fiber is at least th uh, 300 million of euros. Why also to sell this case study? Because uh, North America is the largest and the second is Europe in these markets. For that is our main market of uh, that we can see. 
what uh, we, we have done, we have uh, modified the bio-based functionalization of, of graphene materials, and depending on the of the material, we have seen that there is an increase in the mechanical performance of the of the materials. With you, of course, but also with the functional, not with all of the functionalization, but with some of them, we have obtained the similar results. And with one of the bio-based gra graphene oxides, we have obtained similar, but reducing drastically the health and safety risks of these materials, even at very high concentration. Moreover, we have also tested in, in polyamide 6 for recycling. And we, we have test, uh, done is when, when there is in the, uh, inside the matrix, the functionalized graphene material produce a drastically improve of the recyclability of, of this material with very, very low percentage. And when it's inside the material, even after uh, end of the life recycling and also reuse, we don't see negligible or any suggesting risks to the to the human health. Uh, what have we learned from uh, Save Addition for Nano project? I think there is uh, a lot of alternatives to use in advanced materials industry of these protocols. Also, uh, these protocols must be uh, implemented not just in the final product. Because for us, the safety of, of our workers and also the, the legislation, because the legislation is, is very important, ECA with the REACH, but also other European, national, and, uh, and regional uh, legislation for a company that is in not just uh, a small size, that is at least in, in, in medium one, is extremely important. Also, there is a need to explore different alternatives because. Uh, have a new system under reach uh, now is not buy viable because uh, just one new system by one applicant is years of, of bureaucracy. And also we need to have uh, like the premise of uh, health and uh, of our workers. Uh, also another example is the save by design preparation of high impact, uh, also oriented with uh, automotive nanocomposites. And we have come, uh, uh, compare pristine graphene with another 2D material that is the very few layers of, of magnesium hydroxide that is is a graphenoid material and we, we have detected that the, with the there is a drastically improved in the impact resistance that is one of the main objectives in, in automotive industry with a negligible effects compared with the uh, unfunctionalized graphene material in the in the um, even in release and also in the spatial of, of this material for that we have a, a material that has similar or even better performance without any or without minimal like the like the um, uh, uh, the testing uh, material compared with that what are the main achievements that finally, yes, to conclude, what from us is in the production and scale up of graphene materials, we have reduced the 45% of the chemical products in the production of RGO and 97% reduction in liquid phase equilibrium graphene materials, we have different materials. And in the case of energy, 97% reduction in LPA and GO 96% and close to 90% in RGO. In, in case of, uh, of uh, exposure, 71% of, uh, of this is during the working pressure of the by implementation of this uh, of this save by design process. Also in the in by in situ exfoliation, this is a pattern that we have directly exfoliation during the production of composite we have Emission free, no detecting any emission of any uh, of any nanomaterial. In the com in the composite production, also based on nano intermediate that we also produce emission free, don't detect any emissions of the of any graphene material. And also, we have uh, an effective functionalization of graphene related materials to reduce the health and safety issues. Also, we have uh, experience in reducing emission of 3D printed graphene composites, and 
effectively and align with the later the results we have observed similar behavior and in the production of of uh, of slurries or graphene materials as an intermediate we also reduce at least an uh, 18 percent of the of the environmental impact just production of the uh, just for reduce the uh, energy consumption and thank you you have any question Thank you very much, Julio. We have time for one question. There is any? Yes, over there. Thank you for the presentation. Um, my name is Van Kerkhoff Gunter. I'm eventually a colleague from you. I'm the, I'm the same business in the industry. <laughs> I see that you had a um, huge business going on in the automotive, correct? Yes, yes, yes. At least um, so I saw many parts of the car were involved, and it's really like huge volumes with big players. I think uh, the volumes that we produce is approximately 400 tons per month. Nice. nice. It's uh, so close to 4,000 tons. How could you convince your customer, so the customers in the automotive, uh, or to ensure them that there is no risk of exposure during the life cycle when your nanomaterial is involved in any kind of composite? So there are different composites, so they have all a different behavior. Yes, this is just an example. Oh, uh, there is no, but there is just an example that I put there. There is a, an abrasion of a polyamide six, but it, this is the abrasion of the master batch because really in real use is ten percent less concentration because it's, it's diluted in the matrix. And with that, we have seen that there is any release of individual uh, graphene materials and even. There is a lot of toxicological uh, studies with the with the particles after abrasion, and there is any significant effect or like the control. You focus on one case that needs to be used as no, a reference no, for the rest. No, 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 no. no. But depends on the client. For example, uh, Fabrezia, that all the people know that is one of the principal tier ones in Europe. We have uh, they have used our material there. They have also uh, make individual uh, analysis of of um, of release of particles with, the, for example, with the ion uh, systems, and directly because we have it from a lot of years ago, and they have don't detect any. Also, for example, this is uh, related with the extruder. They don't detect any particle because also one that I say we sell also introducing a matrix and we sell like. A, Nano intermediate done with that they produce the the final material. Thank you very much. Thank you, Julio. And we have one last presentation in this session from Adriano Ferrara from uh, Uni in Italy. And he will talk about how a standardization tool can boost can boost research and innovation. Thank you, everyone. So as you can imagine from the title, my presentation won't be technical as the previous one. But I will try to explain a general overview of standardization and in particular why you should consider standardization when you draft a horizon proposal and which can be the benefits from standardization in horizon project. So just give a quick overview of my <laughs> organization. I work from UNI. UNI is the Italian standardization body. Actually, I'm a project manager at UNI. I work in the development and innovation department, where I follow the standardization and dissemination activity on the Horizon project. UNI is a private non-profit association born in uh, 1921, so more than 100 years of experience on standardization. It's recognized by the Italian law and by the European regulation. We, of course, develop technical standards in all sectors, excluding the electrical and electrotechnical one. We participate in European research project, Horizon project in particular, LIFE also. And we represent Italy uh, to the uh, European Standardization Committee at CEN, and also, of course, in International Organization for Standardization, the ISO. What is a standard? Just a nice definition of standards. We I like to this definition. A standard is a formula that describes the best way of doing something. 
Standards are made by ex experts, experts like you, and uh, sometimes uh, experts coming from different organizations, experts that are actually competitors, but they sitting on the same table and share their knowledge in order to achieve common goals. And our role is to manage the consensus from them. Uh, you know that there are different standards, standard on quality management. The example, the famous one is the ISO 900 900001. <clears throat> standard on environmental management as the series of 40,000 and so on, but also standards on security, IT security, food safety standards. And, and so on. But now the focus is why standardization participate in your Horizon project. So the context is what you see. It's about the EU standardization strategy. It's a strategy that the European Commission developed two years ago. And to underline the importance of standards, uh, and in particular, to support the green and digital translation through innovative standards, but also focus on research and focus on standards in research. And our research can support and use standards to transfer the research results to the market. Okay, so I think that most of you are coordinator for Project Horizon Project, and the European Commission invites you to consider standardization for different reasons. One of these, if you consider standardization in your project, the impact of your project can increase. And, <laughs> but what, the, the, what, what are the role of standardization in, uh, in European projects? Standards facilitate, of course, the dissemination of the content and also um, shorten uh, the times of dissemination, promoting interoperability, of course, and creates relationship between the researchers and the technical committee at Senelec level, but also at ISO level. And this is what we try to improve uh, when we participate as a partner in European project. Basically, this is the action what we do in a Horizon project. So we consider <laughs> when we draft a proposal. So before the project start, we consider the existing technical standards to avoid duplication and to consider which are the best standard suite that suit more with the topic of the project. We use also, uh, we promote a kind of uh, relationship between the uh, research partner, the, the, the consortium, with the technical committee, we call this agreement the liaison agreement, in order to promote the research to the technical committee dealing with the focus of the project. And this is the case of Asina on nanotechnology. We a lot of time we <laughs> interface with CNTC on nanotechnology to show what we have, do, have done in the project, and I will show you in the next slide. But also the last but not the least we try to promote a kind of document that we call SEND Workshop Agreement. These documents are, are a pre-standards that basically are using to connect the research to the market, to transfer the content of research using the, these very important tools that uh, I invite you to check. And if you want more information, we can give to you how to develop this document. And uh, basically, okay, this is to sum up state of the art analysis, need assessment and gap analysis because uh, it happened that um, during the project, some stand, we, we, we find that something is missing in a standard. And we also invite the technical committee to uh, consider the result of research projects and to, to, to fill the gap on the standardization. And at the end, we try to promote new standards, pre-standards, as I said before, from the research project. So if something could be standardized in a project, we use this tool to standardize them. And uh, what we did in ASINA. ASINA has just concluded a few days ago, in the end of February. 
and we are involved we were involved in asina since the beginning as a partner and we start with the state of the art analysis answer to this question which are the quest the standards the relevant standards for the project and from this uh, this question we developed a toolkit an online toolkit that we will show you later and then to to have a first validation of what we have mapped we have a confrontation with the, in this case with the national committee on nanotechnology so we have a first validation from them but then we have also a need assessment with the consortium so we try to identify which is missing and the result of this need assessment we fill in our last deriva deliverable uh, with a strategic roadmap, so which is missing and some consideration that you can find in this deliverable that is public. About the mapping of the standards, we're starting from a baseline. This means that we start working on the mapping before the project starts, so we start mapping standards during the grant agreement development. And then, as I said before, we develop these mapping during the, the project. We have a validation with the transversal activity. We, we to do this, we of course analyze our database with the more than 20,000 standards, the ISO database too, and then we have a validation with the technical committee and dedicated activity to validate in, internally the, to the consortium. At the end, we have the standards mapping. <laughs> okay. This was the first look of the standards mapping. It's an Excel file. We divided it in column. Each column contains specific information. Uh, there is a, okay. uh, the, of course, the number of the standard, the title, the link to the, to the standards, of course, because standards are not for free <laughs> and you have to buy it. So clicking on the link, you can find the standard. Not all the standards, I mean, the, the proper standard, the ISO EN standards, but then the SEND workshop agreement are free <laughs> because they promote innovation. This one as on the state of the art, so it's something that is defined. <laughs> so the scope, but also the main topic, the area, the keywords, the technical committee of standards belongs to, so the ISO, the SEND and the UNI in this case and the status of the standards. So if it's current or work in progress. So we mapped 170 standards, 153 uh, current, 17 work in progress. But, uh, as we don't like Excel files, because sometimes are not so useless, they get lost in cloud, they get lost in repository when the project ended. We decide to give more dynamic uh, overview of this on this. And we, we we use Power BI to set this. Uh, this is just a frame, but if you go on the Asina webpage, you can find the toolkit where easy to find and navigate in it, and you can find all this information that I show you in the Excel file. <clears throat> At the end, this is the deliverable that you can also find uh, uh, for free and uh, not for free, freely available. And uh, this is our project, just to show you not how many projects we are, but standardization involves different topics. We move to application of hydrogen, to the public transportation ships, to the construction sector, to the automotive sector, to the application of digital product passport, bio product, and so on. And I think that's all. This is the link that you can check more details of what I say. I recommend you to check a CWA, and also standard plus innovation. And this is our, not all the team, but just the three reference people. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Adriano, for your presentation. There is a question over there from, yes, actually I was about to read an online question from an online participant. Um, I will do this while uh, the microphone is working. The biggest problem that I see trying to contribute to standards is to develop a standard takes longer than the duration of the EU project. No. And after the project, the researchers have no funding and no time left to follow up the standard development. Do you have any solution? Yes. And the solution is what I said before, it's the same workshop agreement. This is a press standards. They are made to cover this issue. I mean, you can, 
develop this in a time frame of maximum nine months because they are kind of guideline. So you develop this guideline to codify not a state of the art, of course, because from the research project, there is no state of the art, but you can codify an innovation from this. And then we use this document to test the innovation. We give them for free because there is, is a way to the, to to <laughs> to, enlarge the, to to give to everyone the access to the innovation. And then in the time frame, the, we have uh, like three uh, years to this document, the, the, the lifetime of this document. And in these three years, if the uh, document codify or start to codify a, start of, a state of the art, it can be used to develop a future standards. But in the context of a project, you cannot develop an EN standard, but you have start. You, you should start from a CWA, and this is the way we answer to this question. Nice. Not me, but the same Yes. Thank you. Uh, question from Blanca. Thank you. Uh, so oh, sorry, so loud. Um, yeah, I had two questions. The first question was already asked. <laughs> now my second question on the Sen Warsaw Agreement. The problem is that. From my perspective, industry doesn't read these these documents. They they will read a proper standard. So I think we will still have the same problem of funding, right? Because industry really doesn't follow these ones, do they? Yes. Right? Then, I'm sorry. Yes, this was my question. <laughs> this is can be true, but then it depends how promotes this document and how is behind this document to push them to the market. So we have very strong, uh, like a uh, partner. I don't know, we have the automotive sector with, I don't know, we have SEAT, this kind that if we use 